Thank you all for joining our talk on pregnancy and birth and the stuff nobody talks about. We're so excited to do this for Candelin. Um, and we kind of, we just want to start off with introductions and who we are and uh, why we're a part of this conversation. So I'll start off. I am Ashley Leonard and I am one of the quality first coach supervisors with Candelin but I'm also one of the program managers for our up and coming hopefully prenatal program as well. So uh, Amy, you wanna start off first? Yeah. Hi, my name's Amy Skeens. Um, I was invited by Ashley to this cause we're co-doula type people. So we met each other through being birth doulas. Um, I'm also a LAMFT, so marriage and family therapist associate um, and coaching coaching as an integrative doula, because I love to integrate art and gardening and even animals um, in more of like not a birth doula, uh, but like a life doula. So I just call it an integrative doula. I don't know what really what it is, but it's walking through all kinds of ups and downs with people, births and deaths, uh, metaphorically through life. So great. Thank you. Gila, you want to go next? Sure. My name is Gila Shire, and I was invited through a friend who knows some people in your organization, and I actually was her doula, so I'm a birth doula. Um, my background is that I uh, moved from Germany in uh, 97 to Phoenix, straight into Phoenix, after um, being a nurse in Germany for 14 years, because the birth of my daughter just cracked me open for adventures. I didn't even know what would happen, but it definitely changed me in a big way. Uh, and I decided to leave the medical hospital world and get into alternatives and came here to become a massage therapist. So I've been doing that since 1997 and then added yoga, prenatal yoga. And because of all the prenatal modalities have always been easy for me, clients started to ask me if I would attend their birth and naive as I was, I thought, oh, the way I gave birth 31 years back in a hospital, uh, with the midwives I knew, oh, this will be just like that. And then the rude awakening came. Um, and with that, I also learned that there is a job profession as doula. Uh, and so uh, I beca officially became a doula a few years later and have been servicing women uh, with all of that body work, healing work, yoga, and my birth services for the last yeah, decades. And I'm excited to be here on the panel to talk about the mission we all share and the things we want to uh, bring across to families out there. Awesome, thank you. And Kavita. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Kavita Bernstein, and I'm the Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation at Candelin. And um, gosh, I am a mother of two young boys, uh, four and eight, and took us a long time to get pregnant. And loved my first pregnancy and um, didn't love my second pregnancy as much, but I am just all things pregnancy and, and prenatal care. Uh, I've worked in early childhood health and behavioral health and public health uh, all of my career, and I'm just excited to be on this panel. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, so we gathered some questions on all things pregnancy and birth, and we're just gonna kind of go through them, but we're gonna let the conversation flow naturally and see what comes up in, in our conversation about, about the thing we love most of pregnancy and birth. So the first question I'm gonna start out with is one that as all of us are mothers that we experience, but <clears throat> starting off finding out you're pregnant and oh my gosh, I'm terrified. What do I do? Where do I even start? What does this look like? Um, Maybe let's just talk about starting at the very beginning of finding out you're pregnant. Well, I go first. If somebody doesn't want to go first, I have many thoughts on that. My first thought is take a deep breath, um, sit down for a moment and then think about, and I think this is the conversation. I hope we will be able to create more and more uh, can you step away from the thought that when you find out that you're pregnant, that now you see, need to see your doctor and go to a hospital? Because I find that the imbalance we face, not just in the US, but in many countries, developed countries, is that, that we're programmed that this is the most taken route to take. 
And uh, for that, I, I'm on a big mission to promote midwifery and different um, positions where you can give birth at different places. So uh, for me, education is the key. And besides celebrating that you found out that you're pregnant, it's not like, oh my God, what do I have to be afraid of? It's switching to, oh, I'm so excited about what's going to happen. I wanna stay curious, open-minded. I wanna learn and I wanna connect with uh, families and women who've experienced all different ways of giving birth. I think, you know, I, I do think that when you're first pregnant, you can be either excited or terrified or both mm -hmm. and everything in between, right? It's like a flood of emotions that happens. And I think one of the first things to recognize is that it's totally normal to be terrified. Um, it is a big journey being pregnant and you know, like your roles are going to change. Like a lot is going to change and it can definitely feel terrifying. So I think it's like the first thing I would say to someone is to say a lot of people feel the same way when they find out that they're pregnant and not, it's not joyful and exciting for everyone. It can be terrifying and it's okay to be terrified. I think for me, the reminder that women have been doing this since the beginning of time really just kind of grounded me um, and helped me feel like, okay, generations of women have done this before me. Generations. My mother did it. My grandmother did it. All these women have given birth. And look at where we stand today. All of these formidable women in my life and on this world and this earth have done it. I can do it. So I think to me, getting rooted in our history and knowing that so many before me have done this and have done it well, gives, gave me just that breath of, okay, I can do this too. And then I'm a planner. So I just went into kind of planning mode, but just that reminder that I'm not alone. And so many women do this every day um, was super helpful for me. Yes, I agree with all of that. I get really excited about different things that you two shared um, for a number of reasons. We all have different responses for a number of reasons, not even just within ourselves, but even our lives, our stories and who impregnated us and <laughs> what that means for our future. And there's just a lot of reasons why we can be really excited and really fearful too. So um, I love the whole remembering how ancient this is, you know, what's happening in our bodies at that moment is happening, but it's happened for all of time and it isn't anything new. And while we're glad we have medical people, um, I agree, Gila, the, the thought of having to run and have someone else save us or help us. It's one way to do it. And it's another thing to just slow down and really just take in and, and acknowledge what you're feeling, whether positive or unpleasant. Um, and know that there's all kinds of women around us, all kinds of people who've done it and, and are skilled resources. Thank you. Yeah, I resonate with all that. And the one thing I would probably only add to all the things you said was maybe finding that point person that you can either rejoice with or fall apart with or I'll go through those emotions with and really reach out to that, to that one person and build that foundation and being able to have a support system around you as you walk through it. Um, whoever that may be in your, in your life. Great. <clears throat> so the next thing, the next question I see is my body is going through so many changes and some of them are weird and I'm not used to this. And what is this? What is this thing coming out of my body? Um, and so maybe let's talk about those, those bodily changes that we don't talk about that happened during pregnancy. And maybe what was the most weird or abnormal thing you experienced in your pregnancies or you've walked through with someone in regards to the changes that happen during pregnancy in our bodies? All right, I'm gonna say it. My nose got gigantic, and I don't know why. <laughs> and I was like so self conscious about it. Even my sister was like, "Something's going on with your nose." I'm like, "I know. It's because I'm pregnant." Um, and like that's something no one told me would happen. Um, that my nose would get big. That my shoes wouldn't fit anymore. Like that my feet actually might grow in size. Like I was like, "What?" 
Um, not just like being swollen. It's like, you know, some of those things that no one tells you about, like everyone talks about the joy of like the glow, but no one told me that my nose would be huge and my feet would grow. Um, I was, yeah. And that like hair would grow in places that like, I didn't know was going to happen. Like, I was like, oh, there's like a lot happening here. (laughs) So for me, yeah, I mean, it's, it's there's a lot that people don't talk about um when it comes to body change I think a lot of people talk about like your belly getting bigger and like your boobs getting tender and larger that's as much as I would hear about body changes but I think it's like so much more than that oh yeah those hormones are powerful I mean all the different hormones and so I've had four babies and while some have similarities each pregnancy is really unique too so you know, skin issues, um, hair loss, uh, even just your body, different skin changes with darkening. I mean, I've had people be like, what is happening to my belly button? There's this line that's just like a dark line. And you don't always hear about these really scientific, really normal things that happen to our bodies. Uh, Kavita, can I ask a question? So was that the last month or two? How yes. when did that happen? Just the very end? Yeah, with both of my pregnancies. Like I like my for my first pregnancy, because it was our first pregnancy and we were like we tried for three years. And so like we did like one of those baby moons. And it was like, you know, that our last month of pregnancy and like all of my pictures, like my nose is like gigantic. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm just gonna, I can't do anything about it. And I was like, I'm just gonna hope that it goes down afterwards. And if not, and just it's going to be my remembrance of this amazing uh, journey that we're on. Yes. That That's puffy that face, iconic. that puffy face is so funny at the end. Yeah. Not just the features, but everything did it. Yeah. How long did it take for it to go down for you? Um, not too long, to be honest. I don't think, I think maybe a couple of weeks to maybe like a month or two. I don't really remember. I, I gotta tell you, like I was like in survival mode of like, I don't think watching I your looking, nose every day yeah I wasn't really looking in the mirror much I was just more like how do I sleep how do I get baby to sleep like what am I doing with feeding like you know all those things totally I also uh besides everything you girls already said um I also had a change in old body odor oh. so my own body odor changed plus my nose my smell sensitivity was just through the roof uh, with likes and dislikes. Um, and besides that, uh, there are also all the emotional changes you go through, uh, besides what we already mentioned when you just find out, but it can also be a real time of bringing up stuff you haven't thought about and boom, out of a sudden it's there. And, and that's, for example, something I wish somebody would have told me when I was first time pregnant Because I think if we incorporate that understanding that, uh, I don't know who said it, but pregnancy or the whole journey is a rite of passage. And that's all part of it. And the more you actually allow yourself to open up to all these unknown things or things you didn't expect, uh, the the more um, likely you will support yourself to prepare for the big day with maybe less baggage or less concerns or less questioning everything. Because as all know, whoever birthed, uh, birth is the time when we have to completely let go, not just at birth, but getting there and to surrender and really welcome an unknown experience. Even if you had a baby before, every time you birth, it's a new unknown the field you enter and and there's so much wisdom and so many blessings in it that that's another thing I'm I'm excited about when when I talk to women who find out that they're pregnant I just want to mention like there were some body changes too that like I totally loved like I mean my skin totally felt so soft like I don't know how it was like magical uh, I was like I don't, I don't know I'd always feel this shoulder I'm like oh, it's just so soft and I loved my baby bump I loved having my baby belly um and for once in my life I will say it I loved having bigger boobs I'm like this what this yeah. is what it's like <laughs> didn't, yeah, didn't last very long after yeah. but I was like all right so I mean I think there are like body changes that are 
unknown, unexpected, and challenging. But I think it's important to also remember there are going to be some body changes that you're going to love and um, that are going to be part of that experience that you're going to just be like, yeah, this is really neat. Um, like when you feel your baby in you, like for me, I just thought that was yeah. like the coolest thing. And you mentioned you had the line, the linea alba. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that so disheartening when women say they don't like that. While in other cultures, this is the epitome of beauty. This is the example of that you are ripe and ready and that your body is blossoming. So there's also that uh, missing knowledge that some of these hormonal changes who color our body like with extra symbols or signs of that we're carrying life are not even knowledgeable to a lot of people or they're getting labeled into the total opposite of what they actually are supposed to represent. So. I love that Gila, the recognition of cultures and we can just get in our own little worlds and only know what we know. And this is a great beginning to have a conversation online virtually, but there's so many circles. There's so many places uh, to learn from others and how they, their perspective might be different and it helps us and we get to share ours too. Thank you all. I had two really weird symptoms this last pregnancy. I have three kiddos, but this last pregnancy, um, my armpits got really, really dark. Did anyone ever, anyone else? Yes. Okay. I didn't. Mine like got that. little darker. Yeah. Yeah. With my first two, I did not experience that. But with my third, it was, I was like, something was wrong. <laughs> something was wrong with my armpits. So it was definitely, even each pregnancy will look different. You'll have different symptoms and different uh, things happening to your body that you just don't expect with every pregnancy you have. So and since you mentioned armpits, it continues throughout the body. It's not only under the arms, it's the color of your nipples. It can also be mm -hmm. the color change on your labia changes throughout pregnancy and at birth again, very much. So it's all a symphony of the hormones doing the magic. Right. And isn't this all of womanhood? Like our bodies are always going to be changing. Yeah. I know we're talking about pregnancy specifically, but oh man, what a journey from the day we're born till the day we're not here anymore. Our bodies are going to be changing all the time. Yeah. Um, so kind of going in, I know we touched a little bit on the emotional side of it, but really thinking about what can I do? I have, what if you're, you find out you're pregnant and you're going through your pregnancy and you start experiencing rage or you start experiencing depression or you start experiencing maybe extreme joy too. You know, what can I, what can I do with these maybe extreme emotions that are coming in waves during my, during my pregnancy? What can I do and what resources do I have? Well, I would first and foremost say that rage, yes. <laughs> Depression, being sadness, yes. Those are all really healthy and normal apart from even being pregnant. Like it's totally healthy and normal for us to understand what we're angry about and what we're sad about. And so the hormones can be intense, even with a little male in us versus a little female. Uh, it changes our hormones, the baby's hormones. I think they all kind of interacts. And so, um, Oh man, I mean, I think sometimes we're quick to run to the internet, right? And, and punch in what they think. And while it can be a resource, um, someone once said it's, you know, if we go to that the quickest versus just even sitting with our feelings and having time and space to recognize what it is we're actually feeling and having compassion for ourselves, that's the first step to even be able to know what I'm feeling and then um, explore a little bit and be curious about what that might be connected to. Was there something that happened? Did someone say something? Am I afraid of something because I saw something or heard a story? But rather than quickly trying to find an answer or solution, just taking the time to slow down and know yourself. Like, wow, this is real. I'm really experiencing rage or anger right now or um, some sadness or fear. Um, and then it's wonderful that we have doctors, whether it's a midwife or a doctor, it's wonderful. We have people that are experienced that we can ask questions to that can decrease anxiety that can lessen because how do we know if it's normal? We won't until we reach out to trusted people, safe people who we can ask. Agreed on everything. Um, 
which I think is the common ground we share here anyways. It's beautiful to have those conversations flowing. Um, I, uh, anything I say, I just want to point out, I'm not here to badmouth the medical system. As, as you already mentioned, it's important when needed. Uh, yet nevertheless, after having it, uh, having been in the birth field for so many years, and my first decade was mainly in hospitals till I switched and switch away more and more. Um, I really feel like we need to talk more about the fact that there is a choice of which provider you choose because there is a difference coming with these emotions to an OB office where there are mostly a group of doctors serving you. And if you're lucky, you are in for 10 minutes. And that's what I uh, learned over the years of working with moms who uh, worked with doctors. There's hardly ever really the suggestion of what do I do with those feelings? Mm -hmm. uh, where do I go? There isn't really the time for directing specific needs uh, in that area to the professionals who are maybe not part of mainstream medical world, but for example, holistic body workers or even therapists, or by now with, with all the trauma work uh, available, it might even be a good thing to look for somebody who does that kind of supportive work in regards to pregnancy, you know, or I feel very fortunate that my body work with the moms I work with allows the mother to not only connect with me, but gives her the space where she can open up about things she may not ever have thought about, but then it comes up because there is touch and there is the space for it, you know? So um, the alternatives outside of a mainstream system, I find are absolutely crucial for also the, the safety net for the mother, how she feels. Um, and again, a birth center, for example, comes with classes, with meeting moms in groups, same with home birth settings. Most midwives offer all the classes you have to prepare for, or they have women's circle, or even rent tent circles, or anything in the department of motherhood under one roof, you know? And I find that in a world we're living in where so many people don't even have a tribe when they have their first baby and where the origin of the support system is hardly ever there. That's also why doulas are so popular because we're filling in something which used to be available without that you had to ask for it, you know? Um, that's why I find it's crucial that women have a village and a village doesn't have to be big, but it needs a few people she can relate to and she knows she can always pick up the phone or that person will know somebody who directs me in a different direction. Yes, I was so interested when I became a doula, I was training and there were a couple nurses in the doula training mm -hmm. who loved being a nurse, mm -hmm. but because of the way it worked in the hospitals, they were really missing yeah. being able to support women emotionally and actually be able to stay there and be present and listen to those fears and those anxieties and things. So there were women that wanted to be both a nurse in the hospital, but also do this beautiful emotional work yes. of support. Um, so it was a different hat now in this world, in America here, the way it is, it's a different hat. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would say if you have um, a doctor or somebody that hasn't heard you or um, maybe dismissed what you're trying to share as far as your feelings, it's not, a, it's not about, about me, about us. It can be the practitioner. It can be their limits, both personally and professionally. <laughs> so it is, even in our friendships, you know, sometimes our friends aren't able to be good listeners and for a number of reasons, but it's important to find people who can not dismiss our feelings and sit with us. And that too is very, very healing and supportive. It's just a basic friend who can hear and not uh, put you down or have you feel strange. For maybe some of our listeners that don't know, can you explain what the difference between a doula and a midwife is as we're, that's naturally happening in our conversation and talking about both of those? Kila? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Um, here's the big difference. A midwife is a professionally trained um, provider, which specializes obviously on anything motherhood and also prior to that includes she 
it trains three to four years, depending on which route she takes. And I don't even want to get into the craziness of the different midwifery levels we have in the US, because that's something which is not logical to me at all. Uh, because a midwife is a midwife is a midwife and here they get categorized depending on what training they went through and they all have different regulations and allowances but a midwife trains professionally and again not against talking against doctors but the time a midwife spends on learning everything about the female body is I don't know how many more hundreds of times more than an OBGYN actually practices and studies or witnesses birth a doctor these days, most likely never sees a vaginal birth unless they want to be there, unmedicated vaginal birth. So the midwife learns all of that. And in a home birth scenario, for example, it's the hand down tradition from thousands of years of generations ahead of us who've always supported women and that knowledge is passed down. And uh, a doula here only for the US is a three day training anybody can take. And then you have to do three births and get your letters of approval from the birth team you've uh, supported. And then you can pretty much go out, out into the world and, and serve. Uh, in other countries, there are much longer programs, uh, up to even two years in Europe or six months in Holland. But it's totally up to the doula what she does with the short intense knowledge she gains because reality is if you go through a three-day doula program don't expect that you know your stuff and that's also why it's so challenging because we have a mass production of doulas um, as we have of massage therapists and yoga teachers and it's all needed and all necessary yet it also waters down a lot and a lot of people who maybe don't understand the for me sacredness of of this work and of this service to families, um, miss the point of what that is. And, you know, everybody is on their own path and on their own time, but a three-day course most likely doesn't provide you with the important things. You get the bare basics. Um, and from there on, and a lot of doulas obviously do that, they get into more trainings and there are endless options for knowledge to gain afterwards. So that's the difference. As doulas, we don't have any medical or decision-making rights. We are advocates, we are supporters, we are not the voice for a parent, but we're training our parents to become the voice. Uh, in that regard, not necessarily the laboring mother. The laboring mother needs to be a vessel of knowledge. The father or the partner, whoever that is, um, needs to be the rock next to her when she's in a scenario where she has to make a decision and get maybe gets bombarded by now do that. So uh, we have a lot of methods as, as birth keepers and protectors to, to educate our couples or the moms in, in how to protect or how to diplomatically prepare for possible, um, I wouldn't call them confrontations, but interactions with providers where we just need a little more space to make a decision. Uh, and that's, for example, also a big part of uh, a doula's role to not speak for the parent, but provide them with the information so that they have the options they best actually know already about, and then they make their choice. So I will never be the one saying, no, this can't work, or that you shouldn't do that. Although I'm guilty, I did that once in a horrible situation where I just, couldn't keep quiet, but it's not our job to interfere. We are mainly there to support the mother and her team uh, for well-being, for staying in the space um, and being connected to, to the process. I hope I wrapped it up in a, yeah. in a logical way. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Yes, I would say a midwife, you know, the cervical checks, you know, a doctor, a midwife is going to actually yeah. touch your body, check your body, yeah. see how dilated you are, do the baby's heartbeat and things like that. The doula is um, there to provide emotional support and physical too. So when you're a pregnant mama, sometimes you do want massage and you want touch and you want love that way. And sometimes you don't. Um, but the doula is there to primarily be an emotional support and then a physical support with ideas. Uh, research shows that 
uh, we have our best births as women when two things can happen. When we feel like we get to make our own choices, that's a huge one. When I get to make the choice of what I want to happen, that helps birth be positive. And then also to know that you have a team, a team that listens to you. So a doula is there kind of like, like Gila said, for sure, an advocate to protect that space um, and to love on that mama and her partner emotionally and physically sometimes for sure. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, <clears throat> so kind of a fun question that <clears throat> we can talk about and sometimes makes people uncomfortable to talk about, but is it safe to have sex while pregnant? And what is that like? And what if I'm scared to have sex? So I will say that I think, I feel like every emotion while you're pregnant is the right emotion for you to have at that time. So if you're not feeling comfortable, you're scared, you don't know what's going to happen. Well, first of all, you can have sex while you're pregnant. Um, two, talk to whoever your provider is, whether it's your OB, your midwife, talk to your doula. Um, if you have feelings around it, and most importantly, talk to your partner, whoever your partner is, and communicate what is happening and going on in your body and in your mind and what you're really feeling about it. Um, some women might feel like they want to be more sexually active when they're pregnant. That is totally normal. Others may not want to be touched when they're pregnant. It can be kind of a hard thing to accept uh, to that level of touch when you're pregnant. Um, and like I said before, I feel like every, every emotion that you're having is the right emotion to be having because that's that's what's currently happening to you and your body um, in that moment. I want to add right away to what you said, because yes, absolutely. Yes. Here's the challenge I sometimes see is the partner, the male partner very often thinks it's dangerous or it could hurt the baby or the guys often don't feel comfortable with making love when they're pregnant. And, and that's a stigma I feel like, again, it's absolutely the decision-making of a couple if the energy flows, because why, why bother for something uh, to set up artificially or under, under pressure? Mm -hmm. But uh, also to keep in mind that making love, uh, coming together will always increase the oxytocin level. And so in the natural um, kind of department for helping to get a pregnancy, a birth on the road is always on top make out because that's the best way to see if labor may start. So uh, I, I find myself often that I have to explain the fathers that it's absolutely safe to uh, make love. And that's, here's the other thing. What does it really make, mean to make love? It doesn't mean you have to have intercourse from the get go. It's a way longer field of exploring and being playful and actually uh, maybe learning new things about each other because yes, there's a third person involved and uh, that is also a precious way to actually find yourself together with your loved ones and, and just be playful with it. Yes, some people feel hornier. Yep. And others aren't at all. It's just really unique. And without having to go deep and deeper, it is what it is that day. And then if you see a pattern, you know, think about it, take some time, talk to people you trust, um, being pregnant, becoming a mother. It is quite a journey of deepening ourselves and understanding ourselves and our story more. And so I think anatomically, it's really empowering to look at pictures and show maybe if your partner is scared, like, oh, I don't want to hurt you, you know, learn about the body then mm -hmm. that if it's, if it's, uh, you know, vaginal penetration, that's not getting to the baby. <laughs> it might be a really great start to understand what's going to happen in birth, mm -hmm. that that whole right. vaginal canal, yeah. there's the cervix that's closed where the baby is. So the baby's up in here. And that cervix is closed and this whole vaginal canal is where penetration occurs and it's not hurting the baby. So just getting sciency about it and getting curious and learning about the body. And then for sure, Gila, there's lots to sex. There's lots to enjoying each other. Um, and it's okay to listen to what you want and what you don't want. And it's super important to be able to communicate that to your partner. 
Wonderful. Thanks. Um, trying to keep track of time too. So one of the next questions is, uh, my ultrasound is abnormal and what do I do? What, what are the first steps I should maybe take? And also maybe discussing the possibility if your infant might have special needs and kind of walking into that after, after birth. Well, it absolutely depends on now is specifically who is your provider. Uh, if you are already with a doctor, that would mean you have a conversation with him, her, and then most likely get transferred to a specialist and have further conversations. And it requires, again, to really work as a team in your relationship because any diagnose like that pushes buttons you never had happened before because you most likely never had the experience before. So it's about transparency and, and sharing your fears, your concerns, but it also includes really fundamental questions about the what ifs. Uh, that's why pregnancy is such a wide, fast um, field of exploration because you never know. Uh, the best thing to say is you can never plan for a birth. You can prepare, but if you kind of go through the checklist only, you can bet that something happens which wasn't on your list. And now you're not prepared, you know, or you didn't plan on that. So uh, when a diagnosis like that comes, uh, it, it's definitely important that you really feel being heard by your team, by your provider. And if you need extra additional help to seek that, outside of, of that container. I think that I would agree um, with that as well. And I think that, you know, once you have an abnormal ultrasound and you're seeking out further support from your medical team about what that means, and if and when you get a diagnosis, I think it's also really important to um, I think one of you guys mentioned just have your village and have your tribe around you, but knowing that it might be time to expand your village and your tribe to maybe reach out to other parents that are parenting a child of special needs or have a child with that diagnosis. I think it's really helpful to reach out to someone else that could, has walked that path that you're about to, or that you're on, you found yourself in. Um, Cause I think that they can support you parent to parent in a way that is very special and very unique. So considering, I think there's so many Facebook groups out there and other ways to connect with parents that are like looking for you, like they're looking for you. Um, there are parents that want to help others that are just got a diagnosis um, and are, are waiting for you to outreach them. So I think that would be something else I would recommend is expanding your village. Yeah. The waiting is what is so hard. I think most of the time, right? We have an ultrasound and they see something and there's kind of like this flag first. And then there's oftentimes waiting for more testing and an actual diagnosis. And that can all be really, really unsettling because it is, there's those unknowns. Um, and my encouragement is get ready because the rest of life is unknowns without being like, without being whatever. It's just this parenting journey is, um, you know, once the baby comes and the baby grows, there are just a lot of unknowns. And there are a lot of times that we're going to feel really unsettled and not sure about what this means. And uh, for sure, finding people, we are always making new friends, like our core friends, our friends that are our friends now are beautiful and we can keep them and we can also grow new friends who understand these life experiences that are unique. I feel like that's one of the greatest things about <clears throat> social media right now is that you really can expand, expand your people and you can find, find your people that are walking through so many similar things as you, so. Great. Um, one of the next questions is, <clears throat> is, a, is a good one because I feel like I went through this, especially when I had my daughter in 2020, beginning of 2020. Um, but should I have a birth plan and what happens if it doesn't go according to plan? I need to answer right away. <laughs> <laughs> because here's something we are trying in the greater birth community to change, which is also the language around birth. 
Um, and birth plan is one of the words we need to change. Because as I just said, a plan is most likely never unfolding the way you plan it when it's about your birth. Um, so a plan, uh, what the word plan is a dead end. It doesn't give you much options because here's your line of plans and that's where you go. If you change the word from birth plan to birth vision or birth preferences, then also, and I speak from experience, your team at the hospital will welcome you way different than when you come with a birth plan. And that's what they see. And we're, thank God, through the weird days where nurses would see a birth plan as an attack because they would think you're taking over and you think you know more than they do. Um, a birth preference list, a birth vision invites your team to support you exactly with that. And that uh, brings in a much, much better working together. And so yes, birth preference is always a practice in, in working with women, uh, as I do, because even if she plans for home birth, what if there needs to be a transfer? If she is in a birth center, what if there's a transfer? Which doesn't have to be for emergency reasons. There are just some things, things you cannot plan. Here's again, the birth plan you thought you had, nah, doesn't happen. So uh, when I started out as doula, birth plans were just becoming popular and really rejected by the hospitals a lot. And they were like three to four pages long from like, dimming the lights and keeping the doors closed and whatever a mother wanted was on that list because the hospitals wouldn't provide it at that time or weren't meaningful about it. That's all history, thank God. And a birth preference list should be just one page with the main important things, welcoming your team to support you. Here's another really important thing you need to have on your birth preference list to support you for your experience of a physiological natural unfolding. If you have that, those are the best keywords, not against the medical field, but it states clearly what you want, which means don't interfere unless it's needed. Don't push me with things unless we have to have a conversation about it. Same with if a woman goes to the hospital and yay, there are the epidurals, which can sometimes be lifesavers, but are sometimes also the best selling product of a hospital then if she wants to attend, uh, uh, pursue a natural uh, unmedicated birth, I believe it needs to be on the birth preference list to state, please only ask me for pain medication if I, uh, or offer me pain medication if I ask for. Because otherwise the nurses come in, well, how's your pain level? Are you ready for the epidural? That's all messing with her brain. If a woman goes in and knows all that and is prepared for that and strong enough, that's a whole different story, but especially for first timers, it's often really, really hard to withstand all the influences the minute you enter a hospital. So birth preference list, birth vision list, uh, describes in a few short statements what you want, what you don't want, and in particular don't want what you don't want to have happen for baby after baby is born. And thank God by now we are far away from that you have to write a uh, delay cord clamping, skin to skin, that all had to be on it, but by now, not necessarily anymore. But again, for that, you better have a doula at your side who makes sure that all of those things will not be disregarded. So I'm laughing, Gila, because my initial draft of my birth plan, because I gave birth a while ago, eight years ago, so we yeah. called it birth plans back then, was eight pages long. Yeah. <laughs> And I remember giving it to my beautiful and wonderful OB and she took one look at it and she's like, yeah. this isn't going to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and she said, you need to cut it down because no one's going to be able to like consume this yeah. much information. But I had covered every single, I'm a planner. Ashley knows this. I'm a planner. So I plan for everything. Um, and my goodness, do I love the reframe from yes. even what you mentioned earlier from plan to prepare yeah. because for, you prepare for various scenarios. Um, yeah. And I think no matter what you call it, it's it's having a concept, a vision of what you want, but knowing, you know, like any good planner, you have to ask yourself, what happens if this doesn't go mm -hmm. how I think it's going to go? Um, and being open and flexible to different paths and knowing that the most beautiful outcome is being able to see your baby, um, no matter 
Uh, I know I know that some women struggle with shifting their plan even just from natural birth to um, a C-section. You know, that can be really hard. As it? And it, those decisions have to be made super fast. Um, but just remembering that at the end of the day, it's that beautiful daughter or son that's coming out, that's joining you in this in this earth. Um, but yeah, I that was totally me. Ela, I'm guilty. Which is great <laughs> because it's the exercise you needed to become clear about what you really want and vision. Absolutely. So with that, Absolutely. I always do an exercise with my couples where they actually both have to write out an imaginary birth and go from there to the one sheet, what stands out, what's really crucial, and then talk about, because here's again, pregnancy uh, is teamwork, unless you choose to be a single mom um, for whatever reasons. But if it's a team, then the partner has to be involved, included, not equally, because if that other partner doesn't carry, it's a whole different story. But how can we implement the partner in the most efficient way for the needs, not only of the couple, but also for the mother to really feel fully supported? And that requires, for example, that the other partner is emotionally available. And that requires that we talk about concerns, worries, fears, past traumas, stuff like that, because birth can bring all that up in a heartbeat, in a breath. And so that's again, the preparation prior to the big day where uh, the foundation of any union will benefit so much more if that is a conversation prior and the exercise for the birth vision plan comes more playful instead of like, oh my God, now I have to think about what happens if I go to the hospital and things go different. Uh, that's, that's out of the question right now. We're focusing on something we may need and then we put it aside until we may need it again. That's beautiful. I think I'm, um, I'm remembering, well, there's two words that are coming to mind. So longing our longings is something that we can be so easily detached from. We don't want to even know sometimes what we long for because it might not happen. So there's that fear and that anxiety that can come about. And then this relationship or um, the relationship with grief, when something doesn't go the way I longed for it to go, how well do I know how to grieve? Do I even know what that means? And um, am I able to grieve? Because it's losses all life long. All of life is knowing what our longing is and how we want things to go and then being able to grieve when it doesn't go as we plan. So personally, my firstborn was a cesarean and was not planned. I don't think I had a, I think I kind of had a birth plan back then because it was 19 years ago. So I think I was encouraged to write my birth plan out and I think I wrote something out. But um I don't know. I feel I watch moms today and there's much more of a gripping of what's going to happen. So for me, it was like, oh, I have a choice. I get to kind of write out what I want to happen. Um, but it didn't go my way. It didn't go my way at all. I had a cesarean. It was all so different than how I imagined. And then my three other babies, I was able to have V-backs, which is what I wanted. So with each pregnancy after that, I really spent time I'm thinking about what I would want to happen because I didn't get the birth that I wanted the first time. Um, and I held, I held, I wanted it, but I also knew what it felt like for it not to happen. And I saw that I lived through it and that I was still able to love my son. And we had wonderful things about all of that. So um, just this relationship and understanding that it's not wrong for me to want what I want. So I'm going to go into this and I'm really going to imagine and explore what I think would be the best case scenario for me and involving the partner in that too. That's beautiful. That's huge. And you know who the partners are, the first birth isn't going to maybe be the same who they are in the third birth, just like us as mothers. Like we all grow and we all have our experiences for so many different reasons. Um, but it really is fun to include them if they want to be included. Sometimes they don't want to, and that's okay. That's just where they're at. They would rather observe and watch this all. Um, other times they do have their opinions. I love that <clears throat> birth vision and shifting that language. And because all three of my births did not, did not go how I expected at all. And 
by the third time I was like, I'm a pro with this. I know what, I know what to expect. And it all shifted, especially being, um, in 2020 and COVID. And I was telling Amy before we logged on, just, we didn't know what to expect in general in the world. And going through that during that time was, was heavy and there was grief and there were things that I had to, to give up and hope for like having my mom there or, you know, she wasn't able to be there. And, um, you know, thankfully I have a wonderful friend, um, who's also friends with Amy that was able to step in as my doula during that time and fill that space for me. Um, but it was a big shift. And I think, really accepting that maybe after the baby is born too, that there is going to be a time of grief and there's going to be a time of walking through that and walking through your story and maybe writing your story out and having your partner or your doula or whoever was in the room with you to write that out for you. And you can talk about it together. That was, that was a huge healing process of mine in all three of my births. Um, with my first one ending up in the NICU after he was born and not knowing what was happening and being able to write that out and talk about it and talk through, talk through those emotions I was feeling in that, in that birth high. (laughs) Um, Cause I didn't know what was going on. You're in your, your state of birthing and you have no idea what's happening in the room. But um, one of, there's another kind of fun question. I'm so curious and it'll probably be our last question, but I would love in your own words, what is it like giving birth? What does it feel like? What does giving birth to a human being feel like? (laughs) Do you want to hear the words coming out of women's mouth, including (laughs) mine? (laughs) Mine would not be appropriate for Facebook Live. (laughs) The words or the sounds. All the sounds. Wait, Asher, what was the question? What, 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 how would we describe it? Yeah, how would you describe giving birth? What does it feel like? Elating, um, enlightening, but that was years later after I understood the whole complexity of what we're really invited into as a rites of passage. But what stood out for me the most was that even uh, through moments where I was like, I can't do this, I help me out, what should I do? Let me be done with that. An hour I had my, after I had my daughter, I, and I'll never forget that moment. I'm like, I want to do this again. I can do this again. You know, that, that empowerment. Um, and, and, and especially if you then are fortunate to experience uh, unmedicated, undisturbed and physiologic birth, it, it has a whole nother dimension because the hormone symphony isn't interrupted. So your highs are way different than, when you have the support of sometimes necessary medicine, but uh, to in generally understand the potential because your birth experience is something which nobody can ever take away from you. Uh, You have as well to live with the not consequences, but with what happens throughout it and after. And that's another reason why I find it is so important that women are well-educated, prepared, supported, loved up, and can make their own choices because that leads ultimately to the empowerment. So um, birth is everything, feels everything. I mean, I feel so lucky that I was able to experience two births. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, it was just amazing. It's amazing to, to know that you and your partner can bring life into this world and to be a part of that process. And I don't know, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I also loved like, I don't know how to put it, but just the vulnerability in this and the strength, like all all these pieces that come together beautifully, right? You're, you have to trust your team so wholly. You have to let go so much but yet you realize how much you can do in that moment. And I don't know, there's so many things that come into play, but I loved that feeling of complete trust and vulnerability with my team in that moment. And some of the folks, like I gave birth in a hospital, like there was 
Like I still remember the nurse. She was amazing. She was just amazing. And I just met her and I still remember her name, Terry from Banner. If you were on there, she probably not. I mean, like you just from these people that you just meet and are there for you 110% and are rooting for you and caring for you. And you get to be completely vulnerable with them. It's just a beautiful thing. Birth is a beautiful thing. I, that makes me so happy to hear you feel that you to know that you had that. That's very, very special Thanks. that you had your people and you felt supported. It's really, really beautiful. I would say for me, so physically, my first one, I was numb. I didn't feel anything. <laughs> I was a cesarean. So physi- physically, literally, your body is totally numb. Mm-hmm. And your brain might feel a little fuzzy and did not change the fact when they popped his little head over that sheet. Oh my gosh. Just the joy and the surprise of how much he looked like my family. I couldn't believe he looked familiar. And it was it was precious. And then the second one for me uh, was a VBAC all natural. I didn't know that I was a nine when I walked into the hospital. So very intense. It was very intense, uh, painful and um, empowering and amazing to give birth and to push her out. Um, The third was easier. I don't know why I didn't feel as much pain. Maybe my body had experienced it before, or maybe she was in a different position or whatever it was. It was still really intense and fast, but it didn't feel as painful. Same thing though. I mean, actually I looked at her and she looked a little different than my family. She was my dark Italian husband, big head of hair. And I was like, what is this? What? Who is this? This is my daughter. She has this dark head of hair everywhere. So there was uh, a little more intrigue with the third baby. Like, wow, she looks not like me. Um, And then my fourth was really strange. How did it feel to give birth to him? I was literally in the hospital bed. They had just checked me and I was like a nine or 10. And she's like, are you even feeling these contractions? And I don't know why I didn't feel as many. I knew it was happening. I definitely felt the feelings, but that just goes to show how unique and different every birth is. It's so the body physiologically is so unique and, um, some hurt more than others. And, um, like these other ladies are saying, when you see that baby, you're just gonna have your feelings. You're going to look at them and there's going to be all kinds of different, um, feelings emotionally. So. Uh, and I just want to say before we end, like whatever kind of birth you choose to have, whether it's cesarean usually isn't a choice. It's usually something that's done for safety, but whether you choose epidural, you choose OB, you choose midwife, birthing center, hospital, uh, man, seeing your baby for the first time, it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, both of my, both of my, uh, uh, birth or with an epidural, it was still beautiful. Yeah. Um, it was still precious. And so I just want to encourage women to just, whatever you think is the right path for you, it will be uh, hopefully a beautiful and magical experience. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yes, I think that's a great way to end this conversation. And thank you all so much for joining us. We hope to have more of these in the future. Um, just talking about things that might be uncomfortable and bringing normalcy and language and experiences to, to these things we experience. So thank you all so much and look forward to seeing you again.